going to read this evening from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 18, and the first uh, 13 verses. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And Judas, having received a detachment of troops, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, have I not told you that I am he? Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and, and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Oh may God bless what we've just read from his uh, word just now. What we've read is happening on the night before the crucifixion of Jesus. He's counseled and comforted his disciples. Now he's waiting for his arrest, his trials, and eventually his crucifixion. That moment that the, that the whole of human history is, has been heading towards. It's now just hours away. And it's approaching at, at breakneck speed. God's plan of, of salvation is, is about to be achieved. It's been thousands of years in the making, but now it's about to be achieved. Jesus chooses to wait out the calm before the storm, if you like, in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a place where he often went, John tells us, with his disciples. It's a place where Judas, the betrayer, would know where to find him. And tonight, for just a few minutes, I want us to consider some of the events in that garden and see what they reveal to us about the person of our Saviour. We've just sung, haven't we, about wanting to understand what it meant to God the Son to take away our sin. And this evening, we're going to think about what we see in this garden of the person of our Saviour. And the first thing I want us to look at is a truly mind-stretching uh, concept. I want us to think about the natures of Christ Jesus. Not the nature, the natures of Christ Jesus. John doesn't mention uh, Jesus' famous prayer in the garden. Matthew does. And he says that the Lord Jesus Christ was sorrowful and deeply distressed. Matthew 26, verse 37. He records this repeated prayer of Jesus. Uh, just one example, verse 39 of Matthew 26. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is horrified at the prospect of the cross. Not just the physical pain of those beatings and the whippings and the crucifixion itself. 
Not the, the humiliation and the mockery of the Roman soldiers, of the religious elite, of, of the crowds, even those who are dying with him. As horrific as those things are, the thing which is really on his mind, the thing which really horrifies him, is that cup of God's wrath that is about to be poured out upon him as he becomes sin for us. It horrifies the Lord Jesus Christ. The perfect, sinless Son of God in the person of Jesus Christ is becoming sin for us and suffering as if all of our sin is his sin. And this is one of those moments in scripture that really tests our grasp of Bible truth, that really tests our theology. What do I mean by that? Well, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is one person with two natures. He is fully God and fully man. He has a human nature and he has a divine nature. And those two natures are distinct. They're separate. They don't kind of meld into each other or, or cross over in any way. They're distinct and separate natures. Yet at the same time, they are perfectly united in the one person who is the Lord Jesus Christ. As evangelical Christians, we are, we're great at the two natures. And we're rightly concerned to ensure that, that we don't ever confuse them and kind of bring them together and, and make them kind of some sort of hybrid nature. But sometimes perhaps that leads us to neglect the perfect union of his two natures. And perhaps particularly on occasions like this, that we're reading in scripture, it becomes apparent that actually that's what we're doing. We're neglecting the perfect union of his two natures. Now, this is so otherworldly that any illustration uh, I use will, will, will fall short. But, but just kind of picture this. You've seen a three-legged race. Maybe you've been involved in a three-legged race where, where your legs are tied to to someone else's, or, or one of your legs is tied to someone else's anyway. And if that person kind of veers off to the left in the race, then, then you're going to be dragged left with them. You are two people, but you kind of experience what the other person experiences. You go where they go. They fall over, you fall over with them. You are kind of tied together in that way, and you experience the, what they experience. It's a poor illustration, but maybe it will just help you to, to grasp what it means that the human and divine natures of Jesus Christ are, are, are perfectly united. It means that what one nature experiences, the other nature has an experience or a participation in. Uh, it's one reason the primary reason why the Lord Jesus Christ could not sin. In his human nature, he inherited no sin. He had no human father. He inherited no sin nature. But what perfected him so that he could not sin, like the first Adam did, was the perfect divine nature that was united to his human nature. The divine influenced and impacted the human and it works the other way around as well. So the divine nature experiences that the humanity of Jesus. And so you've got to think about this when it comes to the incarnation. For There is a, a sense in which when Jesus Christ was hungry, the divine nature had an experience of that. As God, he had an experience of being hungry. That's why. In Hebrews 4, the Lord Jesus Christ is described as a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses in verse 15 and was in all points tempted as we are, but without sin. So in the garden, as the Lord Jesus Christ looks towards the cross, 
it isn't just his human nature that is horrified. It is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who is horrified. The God-man, these two natures perfectly united together, recoil at what lays ahead. In his human nature, he's going to become sin for us. Of course, his divinity but is perfect, sinless. There's going to be an experience. There's going to be a sense of what his human nature is taking on. In his humanity, he's going to experience the rejection of God. Of course, the divine nature, he's one with the Father and, and can't be separated. But there's going to be a sense in his divine nature, of that separation, because his two natures are perfectly united. In his humanity, he will die across the divine nature. God can't die. But as the person of Jesus Christ died, the divine nature, the Son, is going to have an experience of what that feels like. He's going to have a taste of death. And I think this is absolutely staggering. I think this is completely mind boggling. This is why I say, as we come to the Garden of Gethsemane, it tests our theology. It brings us to really wrestle with this central gospel truth that perhaps often just rolls so easily off our tongues. Jesus is God and man. Yes, he is. What does that mean? Well, oh, that's by far the longest thing I wanted to share with you uh, this evening. Two more points I want to make, and these are, these are more brief. The second one I want you to see is, is the authority of Jesus. I want you to see the authority of Jesus in the garden. Who's in control? Who's in charge? The armed mob that come to him with uh, weapons? Or the unarmed Jesus Christ? Well, consider what John tells us. We notice from verse four that, that Jesus Christ takes control. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? He doesn't wait for them to come to him. As he sees them approaching, he goes out to meet them. And he says, who are you looking for? He initiates the encounter. And then look what happens when he identifies himself. Verse five, they answered him saying they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas who betrayed him was stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and, and fell to the ground. Literally, Jesus actually says, I am. That's why the he in your Bible might be in, metallic, in italics. He says, I am. And that statement, it flattens the armed mob fall back from him. They're left on the ground groveling at his feet as Jesus takes that divine name and claims it for himself. He leaves all of those men who come for him in the dust. Then what does he do? Then he commands them in verse eight to, to let his disciples go. And they do, as all the other gospels make clear. Throughout this encounter then, what I want you to see is there's absolutely no doubt who's controlling everything, who's in charge, who's orchestrating events. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew's gospel, we read that uh, after telling Peter to put up his sword, he says, or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Matthew 26, 53. Not only does Jesus have divine power himself, he actually has the armies of heaven at his beck and call if he needs them. Who's in control here? The Lord Jesus Christ. And then one more, the willingness of Jesus. The willingness of Jesus. We've seen his response to the horror of the cross. We've seen his complete control of events, how he takes charge in the garden. Finally, I want you to consider his willingness to go to the cross. He won't let Peter fight for him. Uh, look at what he says, verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? The cup of God's wrath that so horrified him in that prayer. 
He says, shall I not drink it? Willingness to take upon himself our sin. Then what does he do? Verse 12, he allows the soldiers to arrest him and even bind him. And I kind of smile at this a little bit because I kind of have this picture. Here are these men who have just been groveling in the dust at his feet moments ago. And he kind of, and you can almost picture Jesus presenting his hands to them to, 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 for them to bind him. And them going kind of, um, going, no, you do it. No, no, you do it. Because it's clear that, that they have absolutely no control. That they have absolutely no power. That they have absolutely no authority here. And then I, I picture, and I, I, I picture uh, these men leading Jesus away and, and perhaps trying to look tough, trying to look victorious, trying to look like they're in control and they're, and they're the ones in charge, knowing all the time that they're not. That with just a word, he could throw them all to the ground and walk away again. But he doesn't because he's willing to go to that cross, willing to die in our place of our sin. Well, I hope, I hope at this Easter time, I hope you do reflect not just on events in the garden, but events on the cross, uh, events that, to go back a little bit in between those two, the events of the trials of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course, the events of the resurrection. But I hope as you do, you really dig into them. You really let these deep and, and amazing gospel truths soak in and make the most of this opportunity that you might understand more of what it meant for the Lord Jesus Christ to take our sin upon himself and to pay that price on Calvary's cross. Amen.